Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our future networked car debate. For the first hundred years or so of our motorised transport, things seemed to be so simple. It was a car, it had a petrol engine, it was a lorry, it had a diesel engine, and if it was a Tokyo taxi, it ran on LPG gas. But of course, the last 20 or 30 years, we've seen this revolution begin that's now gripping our industry. And it began with a move to a lot more diesel cars for fuel efficiency. Then the hybrids started arriving with diesel hybrids and petrol hybrids. And now, of course, the big in thing is electric cars. But there was a time when you got into a car and put the key in the lock and turned the ignition and started it up. And that was virtually all it did for you. You just drove the car. And now the whole world has changed so much because we climb aboard our luxurious cabins and as soon as we sit in the seat, our mobile phones are hooked up. We've got the internet on, we've got all our apps working. We've got a satellite navigation system that fires up with an interactive map. We've got our television sets, music, radio, every song that we, we love is tuned in for our fingertips. And the seat moves into your perfect position. The climate control puts exactly the temperature you want. And this luxurious, stylish new Infiniti Q50 is a, a classic example of the breed. It's got everything that I've just talked about, but also it's moving the game on a couple of more steps. It's got the very latest predictive forward collision warning system. And that's now looking not just at the car in front of you, but the car in front of the car in front of you. It's another step forward. And also, for the first time anywhere in the world, this is the very first car to have fly-by-wire steering. So now you can actually adapt it on the touch screen to have the same feel for parking or the same as you want for high speeds and low speeds. It's another step forward. But you know, the question you now have to say, well, what happens next? How far do we really want to go? Because I'm as a racing driver, I still love being involved with the driver. I still actually enjoy changing my gears. So I don't want to lose my enjoyment of driving a car. But the other extreme, for the people that don't want to be involved at all, you know, are we really going to allow them to switch off their brains? Are we going to allow them to put on cruise control, lane control, and then just start checking their latest Facebooks out? You know, do we want to go that far? And uh, you know, we already have cars that can park themselves. You know, can we have in the future automated, fully automated cars and if we can, do we really want them? That's the whole debate that is coming almost closer and closer. You know, will we have new communication devices that uh, go beyond people just communicating with each other? Will we have vehicles communicating directly with other vehicles? Will we have vehicles communicating to devices embedded in the road? All these things are possible, we read about them, but now we have this wonderful panel of specialists and so lots of questions I hope from the audience to actually start debating these issues. So just to introduce my panel I have in front of me, we have Dr. Hamadoun Touré, who is the Secretary General of the International Telecommunication Union. Jean Todd, President of the FIA. Johan de Nyssen, President of the Infinity Motor Company. Russ Shields, the Chair of YGOMI. Jeff Owens, the CTO of Delphi Automotive. And the Director of the Transport Division of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, Eva Molnar. Now, before I turn to the floor for some questions. I thought to get everyone going, I got a question for each of the panelists so they can set out their stall and we can see where they're coming from. And I think maybe we should start with you, Johan, because I might have badly undersold your new Q50, so perhaps you could talk a little bit more about what this car offers and perhaps how you see the future developing. Well, actually, I think you've given such a comprehensive overview, I would have to uh, claim that the car can fly to top <laughs> that. But uh, we want to have it rooted in, in, in reality. I think the uh, most impressive element of the car is the very advanced level of electronics technology that uh, is now available commercially uh, at a $45,000 price point. I, th I think that is the most astonishing for me as a, as a car maker. Um, you've described the... Uh, steer-by-wire technology. We call it uh, direct adaptive steering. Uh, this is an important building block um, to take vehicle safety, uh, passive safety, uh, to uh, the next level. And I say this because it's a prerequisite to take us to what many of us, and I'm one of those, would consider to be uh, the equivalent of automotive hell, uh, which is where we remove the driver from the equation. 
And uh, that is not what we want to do. What we want to do is to create uh, a, a, a safety envelope that uh, I think also expresses our commitment as automakers to let our consumers use our products safely. Um, computers can see and react much faster than the human being can. And I know that we have a, a section on autonomous driving later. I don't want to elaborate that too much, but when you link it all in to the, uh, the area of interconnected cars where the vehicles begin to respond to each other, uh, they slow down events in real time. And uh, they can process the data and make the right decisions. Now, if, if we say that that is all terrible for those of us who enjoy driving, uh, I enjoy driving. I, like, I, I believe that you almost never have too much performance. And that's the kind of car company we want to be as well. But we recognize also that with increasing urbanization, there's a lot of uh, chore that comes with the daily commute. And I could well imagine that if I'm stuck in a three-hour traffic jam commuting in Los Angeles, I might be very happy to have my car help me in that part of the driving experience. And that allows me to use all of the other connectivity features of the car because it turns into a mobile workspace. I remain totally connected. Uh, my office can talk to me. Uh, gosh, the kids can work on Facebook. And uh, the big trick to do this now is to do it in such a way that you minimize driver distraction. Now, uh, I've had a uh, discussion quite recently uh, with the former Secretary of Transportation, Ray LaHood, who said to me, you know, I really think that we should legislate against this. And uh, be careful what you wish for. Because if you do that, the answer is the mobile phone. And that is not designed to be used while you're in the car. So we have to find a way to meet this reality of uh, our consumers of the future of the present uh, to remain connected to their world at all times. And uh, that's part of the challenge for us as automakers. Mm. I'm sure you're overseeing a revolution in Formula One regulations at the moment designed to, you know, to encourage more manufacturers to invest in Formula One technology to use that as their test beds. But you're a bit worried uh, after recent testing, you might have gone a step too far in Formula One. I think the tendency now is to overreact. So I will not overreact before the first Grand Prix has occurred. So I think we, we have to wait now another 10 days. And uh, I'm sure that it's uh, a good vision, for, uh, the right vision for a new powertrain, six cylinders, 1.6 uh, engine, energy recovery, direct uh, injection, 35% uh, less uh, fuel uh, consumption. But of course, all new regulations need uh, a time for adaptation. So it just, uh, for me, the problem, but it will be very interesting because you have some new manufacturers uh, coming. Uh, it uh, allows them to use motor racing as it is due to be at the laboratory. You're going to book a holiday in Hawaii when the first Grand Prix is on. Are you going to be there? I mean, are you intending to be to Hawaii? Maybe we can watch the Grand Prix <laughs> together. <laughs> But Dr. Turi, as Secretary General of the ITU, where, where do you see we're heading with all the new developments in technology? Well, a new revolution is underway. The automotive industry and the ICT sector are meeting together. Uh, and that's going to be great because today there will be, uh, we, we know that by 2020 there will be 50 billion devices connected. And how we interact with our cars, with the surroundings, how we uh, impact the environment are, will be very key in that. And the cooperation between the automotive industry and the ICT sector will be key into that, making sure that uh, you have uh, driver comfort, driver safety, and uh, taking care of the surrounding of the uh, driving vehicles, as well as uh, making sure that uh, you are at, at the same time, enjoying the experience of driving or traveling, simply. Uh, therefore, the ICT sector and the automotive industry are working together. Standardization is key, and that's what uh, my organization is working on. The International Telecommunication Union standardization sector has a focus group on driver distraction, on safety, on creating new uh, uh, spe spectrum for uh, communication between the vehicles and the, its surroundings, uh, between the vehicle and the uh, safety uh, administrations, uh, ambulances and uh, police uh, and firefighters, 
All of those are things that really revolutionize the way we live, the way we drive today. And uh, I believe that uh, the same revolution that happened when computing and communication came together will happen uh, in this uh, new revolution. And we don't know what's going to come out of that, actually. There will be so many new features that we cannot even think of now. Many new things to come. Well, well Jeff, I mean, you're a components manufacturer for the industry. You know, how do you see the future of the networked car? We certainly have an opportunity to make significant gains, I think, in the area of safety, the area of green, and the area of, of connectivity. Um, an average car today in, in Europe or the United States has about 50 computers on the car. That's growing. Um, the 50? 50 already? 50. Some have as many as 100 already. So it's, uh, we, we, we're in the automotive world, but we supply more computers than the computer companies do. I mean, it's one way of looking at it. And there's no stop in that trend, right? I mean, you're able to do, you're able to take the mechanical function into an electromechanical or elect electronically controlled. And that opens up a lot of possibilities. So if we do it right, we should be able to have vehicles of the future that have significantly fewer emissions, significantly better fuel economy, incredibly safer, reduce the accident and fatality rate, and allow the consumer to bring that, that digital lifestyle that they have every place else in their life into the car, but do it with less distraction less distraction, I think, is the, the key word, isn't it? I and mean, Russ, your company, Wygomi, supplied the vehicle communication system for the Q50. So do you actually believe that one day we could have a fully automated car? Um, I think we will have, in not very far from now, um, automated driving in a significant part of our time, particularly expressways. And to me, I value my time. I grew up, we started mobile phones in 1979. The mobile phone completely changed how doing it. Email replaced all the faxes. But as much as I like driving, I'm not in the front seat of the car. Now, I'm in the back seat of the car because I want to use my time right. Now, once we can move to having the automated driving, which certainly on expressway, motorway type things, will be here. Um, I think Nissan's statement aiming for 2020 is a very good statement for that. That will come back to allow me to actually be driving the car but doing the things that make me productive. That will change, again, substantially how I use my time and make the whole driving experience much more valuable to me and I think for, for many other people. And I really would like to get out of the backseat of the car and back into driving but I need that technology so that I'm making use of my time effectively while I'm in the car. But while I can see the sort of idea of, uh, as you say, a freeway and an automated car, but then what about the kid in his 50 Chevy that comes crashing into the side of you? I mean, you're not watching out for him coming. He's not automated. Well, as um, Johan said, the sensors in the cars will do a better job of finding that guy and trying to work and support than I will as a driver. Okay. Um, even, even if I'm really completely paying attention, I'm not talking on the phone, I'm not doing anything that's distracting at all, am I really looking all the time back here for some idiot while I'm watching the cars in front of me? I'd much rather have the cameras, the radar, the computers, to go look at all those things and figure out what they can do. So I, I feel much more comfortable with the car, the kind of equipment that Jeff and his, his people do, um, being able to make that drive much, much safer for me and, like I say, move it so that I can really effectively um, make use of my time completely again. Now, Eva, um, you know, a lot of talk about automated cars, you know, but understand this is something that you'd be responsible for trying to regulate, and this is going to be a massive job, surely. Well, um, regulators are not responsible for innovation. They are responsible for creating the conducive environment for innovations that uh, answer some of the challenges of today. And among these challenges, uh, we see that uh, the future depends on more mobility. Economic growth depends on trade. Trade depends on transport. Um, at least uh, 
the doubling of surface transport is predicted in the next 30 years. Now, how are we going to handle that? Um, population growth, particularly in urban areas, a lot of individuals. If you look at the middle class today, there are one billion people um, in extreme poverty. If the UN Millennium Development Goals achieved, then these people in extreme poverty will be in the middle, middle class, middle um, income people. Middle class normally, usually, I, I shouldn't use the word normally, but usually want to have a car of their own. They want individual mobility. Now with congestion, with all the other externalities, safety, uh, uh, climate change, CO2, greenhouse gas emissions, etc. how to manage all this demand for mobility in a safe, sustainable way? That's the question. And for that, innovations are more than welcome. So the regulator is not to slow down or to accelerate what is not ready, but to create the conducive environment for these innovations. Well, we've had a little tip then of where our, our panelists stand. So now we're going to go over to the audience. But I do have, I know three people out there have already got questions they're busting to ask. There's Peter Burns there for Transport for Canada. You have a question for our panelists. So something that concerns me is that the, the deployment of uh, connected vehicles and automated vehicles is going to be gradual. It's not going to happen overnight. So we're going to have a mix of vehicles in the fleet, old and new, interacting. How can we assure that this transition is going to go smoothly and safely? Yeah, well, um, that, is, that is going to be the challenge of, of any kind of deployment. Uh, if it's consumer-led, then consumers will pick the technologies that they think best helps them, best assist them in their, in their driving mission, however they're looking at it. The sensors and the, the computer capability on the vehicle will, will, will be able, as discussed, to sense the environment around, even, you know, even a vehicle that's not similarly equipped. Clearly, if the cars were similarly equipped, that helps. If they can talk to each other, that helps even more. If there's an ecosystem that they can all operate in, that's wonderful, right? But that's kind of an, that's kind of an end state to get to. So as we walk into it, we, I believe the cars have to have an individual capability to to be able to live in that world and provide the safe, uh, the safe drive that the consumer is looking for. Uh, will that mean uh, a fully autonomous vehicle? Probably not, right, without that ecosystem to go around it. But will you be able to automate certain portions of your drive uh, to make it safer, to, uh, to never get distracted, even if you are, as the weak element in the driving equation? Absolutely. Absolutely we'll be able to do that and be able to sense the, the dangers or the threats that could come from any number of angles in the driving mission. We need to differentiate between a scenario where you literally sit in the back seat and the car is doing the driving. And the other one where the vehicle is assisting you in the driving task, but the car is actually always under human driver control. Uh, because those are two very distinctly different scenarios. And uh, while I would not insult the future by saying that the notion of you returning to the back seat uh, is never possible, uh, this is probably uh, not the, the aimed for landing position that we're looking at now. The driver has to be paying attention. Um, I think when we do automated driving, uh, it starts, we'll actually have a camera watching the driver, preventing him from using a tablet or smartphone. We'll in, continue as the Q50 does, enhancing the displays um, to provide the ability. So if I'm doing my email, I'm going to be doing my email, not on my computer, not on my smartphone, but through the car. And the car will be there if something comes up, unknown, a problem, flash red, beep at me, put your hands on the wheel, take control. That's, that's where I see things going over this 2020, 25 period. After that, I can't see. <laughs> Dr. And Ture, this is a very good question, and the fact is that uh, we need to also shorten the transition time. Uh, how do we do that? By way of standardization. Standardization will be key. That's what helps the mobile industry to go from virtually zero mobile phones to seven billion phones in 10 years. Standardization will enable mass production, will enable interoperability of systems in different countries, different, uh, different places, and therefore it will uh, increase the number of cars manufactured, and then it will reduce the prices, and then affordability will be key to it. And therefore, standardization will be key. And of course, it will be supported by a good regulatory environment that will be, just has to be an enabler 
not uh, an inhibitor of the, of the growth. Standardization. It would be very valuable if you could, in ITU, bring together the leaders of the automotive industry on how to handle this transition, how to build the steps that will get the regulatory side, the technology side, and the communication side all working together, um, because they all have to go into his car. Eva, Eva's been keen yes. to jump in on this yes, one, I think. I think it's an extremely complex question, and we need to unbundle it. One question, do we need dedicated infrastructure for a higher level automated car or not? In the 60s, in uh, traffic safety, the key principle was to separate the horse-driven carts from the motorized vehicles. Now, do we have to raise the same question with the highly automated and less automated cars? This is an open question for the time being. We haven't fully thought it over. Another question about uh, the levels. Am I sitting in the back or not? Actually, why do we think only in terms of cars, individual cars uh, with four seats or six seats? Why don't we think a little bit more about public transport? Because in public transport, we already have driverless uh, mobility. Look at some of the people movers at the airports or look at some of the metros. Uh, so. This needs to be expanded. Then the third question, what actually you are touching on, is the intermodality. Uh, today, thinking only about road mobility is, I'm sorry, wrong. We have to connect road mobility with public transport mobility, with railway mobility, et cetera, et cetera. And in the future, we might even see that some of the cars would take off. And if they take off, and if they, well, yeah, well, there, there was this, uh, fly by uh, night, fly by wire in the 30s, uh, when in aviation we moved to the new generation. Um, definitely, it's a new generation, but that creates far more issues. Traffic management. Traffic management will have to be resolved, and new institutions and new regulations will have to be brought into the play. And we already touched upon responsibility. How long it is the driver or the passenger on the bus who is responsible? and and how long it is the uh, traffic manager, the infrastructure construction company, or the vehicle manufacturer? Who would have the insurance coverage? Mm -hmm. Jean, I think as you're used to imposing regulations, maybe this is your job to put these rules no, together. I, and I must say it's, a, I mean, a fantastic uh, situation we are facing because the world is changing. And uh, to make everything working together is a challenge. And um, I mean, remaining pragmatic, because we had earlier a session to speak about uh, how to create less road accidents. Yep. And I think we should not lose that, which is a major, major issue. I mean, things are moving. I mean, we must not forget that a few decades ago, not so far ago, and still some countries are not using it. Safety belt was something new. Yep. It has been a revolution in the uh, motor industry, but again, tr public transportation. How many people put the safety belt in a bus? Close to none, yeah. you know? So um, if we want to address the problem of diminishing the number of fatalities and on injured people on the road, we must uh, put a very strong united effort with the manufacturers with uh, the governments and s make priorities. Because otherwise, what I will hate to end up with amazing cars for a selected amount uh, of people who very often don't know how to use it and uh, see the tendency of this horrible scourge, which is road accidents going up. So what we need to identify is how with modern cars, with modern infrastructure, we can drop the number of fatalities okay. and injury on the road. Stay. Hold your phone though and talk on a mobile or not? Most of the holding the phone, yes. Yeah. And there's a lot, actually a lot of the science says that the problem of the distraction is not holding the phone, it's the mental use yeah. of the phone. And that there's been um, lots of evidence that says 
we should be looking at all kinds of the cognitive Concentrate on drive. And I have a classic case I, I tell I've worked in Birmingham in England for 25 years, driving home to the south of England. The same motorway turn-off for 25 years. Four times I've gone straight past, on yeah. hands, hands-free, completely legal, but four times I've just driven straight past where I should be leaving the, the motorway. And and so it's last year, on May 17th, ITU was celebrating our... Uh, International Telecommunication Day, and the theme was Don't Text and Drive. Yeah. And we came up with some statistics, very interesting statistics. In the U.S., for the first time, the m- number of people dying from accidents related to using texting and driving has surpassed the number of people of drinking and driving. Yeah. And you're talking about a highly developed country, organized country, where there are uh, reliable statistics. And in many developing countries, unfortunately, there are not even statistics to prove that. And I'm sure it's higher in some other developing countries. But this is the point. That just because it's illegal to text and drive doesn't mean people won't do it. No. Absolutely. Which is why we need to acknowledge this reality. Yeah, and absolutely. then say, how do we do it, recognizing as a human behavior, that it can be done in a less destructive manner? Yeah, how do we avoid the use of technology to be on the negative side? How do we use, uh, avoid uh, distraction, user's distraction on board of a vehicle? But the point is, I would like to see a car where, uh, in case, first of all, the car should be able to avoid accidents. If an accident has not been avoidable, the car should be able, A, to send a message, a, a text immediately to the nearest police or uh, firefighters or ambulance. And the car should be able to send a message in the vicinity of the accident zone so that other drivers don't get distracted and don't be involved in additional uh, 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 accident as well. Those are things that technology can do. And when, once we standardize them, we'll be able then to really uh, have a mass production. Yeah, we're talking about distraction. Just wanted to come back to you out as a manufacturer. There's a lot of talk now advancing touch screens. Not so much talk about voice control, because I, I feel we should move away from touching screens, because it's something you have to look at to touch when you're driving, whereas some of the other controls, you know, an I drive, you don't. And there's not so much talk about voice Different. control. There is a lot of work being done on voice control, and uh, all the instructions that are relevant to that car can be done through voice activation. Okay. Uh, and uh, they are today, I think, really fabulous uh, systems available to... Uh, train the car to recognize the driver's voice commands. Uh, But it's also a matter of training the driver how to issue them correctly. I want to touch on one thing before we get uh, too far away from the conversation, though, if you'll permit me. It's the point you raised about liability. Because while clearly there are still pretty substantial technical hurdles to overcome, the engineers will conquer. But in your opening comments, you said that part of the role of legislature was to create uh, the boundary conditions, if you like, where innovation can grow and prosper and take place. And nowhere do I see a more substantial hurdle to the ability for autonomous driving to contribute to overall vehicle safety than this very question of liability. Because imagine that it is indeed possible for the vehicle to complement the driver's driving ability. And despite the most fantastic sensors and advanced technologies, that one thousandth of a percentage probability happens, and there's a collision in which somebody's killed. Who is liable? And that is a big question that we wrestle with. And you know, uh, I'd like to tell a quick story to illustrate how liability sometimes forces common sense to leave the room. It is technically possible for us, with all the sensors that we have, uh, you mentioned that we will have cameras monitoring the driver's eye movements, we can monitor his rata, we can determine if a driver is having a heart attack. Now, if you have a car that has the ability to drive itself, the common sense thing would be for the computer to figure out where's the nearest hospital and take him there. What happens the guy gets there and he dies because of malpractice of the surgeon, whatever? You don't know. Who's liable? So what is the engineering solution? The engineering solution is, uh uh-oh, based on the advice from our legal people, the car parks itself and it calls 911. That's, from a liability point of view, the sensible thing to do, but common sense has left the room. 
And these are the things that I would say, uh, as a manufacturer, we need to ask our legislators to help create those boundary conditions where actually we achieve the, the desired consequence, which is greater safety for all. No. It's exactly uh, the hottest topic we are facing in these days, liability. Do we have today a boundary or is it a man-made artificial boundary because of lack of courage to accept that what is available today gives enough freedom? So I don't give you the answer, but I tell you that we are dealing with this very carefully. But uh, surely there are a couple of issues here. One is that um, um, according to the current legislation, the driver must be in control of the vehicle. But what does it mean to be in control of the vehicle? Some people say that the whole thing is blown out of proportion, uh, which shouldn't have happened. Maybe. Um, and maybe if you are in control with the stage automation, you don't have a problem. You may have a big liability issue when you reach the highest level automation, not before. But then, taking a pragmatic approach in uh, road safety and in um, uh, road crash investigation, most likely uh, the principles uh, will have to be followed but are followed in aviation. In aviation, you have an investigation which investigates everybody, not only the captain of the aircraft but everybody. So maybe that's the future, but let's not run ahead. Definitely this is the big issue and it is not yet solved. So if I, if I could add, I, you know, we get, um, just because you can do something with technology doesn't mean you should, right, yeah. sometimes. But we do have an opportunity here to, to make a significant difference in accident statistics without, without any doubt. And using the ESC example, um, wonderful improvement. Everybody would agree with that. It ought to be on every car. I think the same is true of many of the technologies that's on this, on this wonderful automobiles. The collision avoidance. The collision avoidance, the adaptive uh, lane keeping. But particularly collision avoidance can make a mammoth impact on accident statistics now. It would be great if we could standardize and we could all march to the same drummer and drive that cost down as fast as possible. We're all working on that anyway. It would be great if governments would say, yeah, you got to have that right now. But then you kind of pick a technology winner and governments take a time to do that. In the meantime, I think consumer awareness, the more you bring consumer awareness up on what the benefits can be, consumers will select, right? We saw that happen with, uh, with airbag transition in the United States. They got in actually ahead of the regulation because consumers became aware that to get a five-star rating car, if you want five stars, you've got to have a certain complement of airbags. We're starting to do that now in the Euro NCAP here and, uh, and in the NCAP in the United States for active safety technology. If we continue down that road, then consumers may select us before any of us get it, get it figured out, right? Uh, and particularly when you've got, you've got nice machines like this that, that demonstrate it and consumers become aware of the benefit. Once you experience ESC, you want it forever. Yeah. Once you experience active safety and you stop that car on an accident that you otherwise wouldn't have been able to, you want it forever. Test, you want right. your spouse in it, you want your parents in it, you want your kids in it. In fact, going back to Dr. Torres, standardization, can we make all these manufacturers the same letters for the same things? <laughs> Instead of PASM and ESC and every manufacturer's got it. We're not ignoring you out there in the panel. So you have a question for us. Uh, who owns the data? Is there a societal obligation uh, for the owner of the car to surrender control of his data in the event of an accident so that proper forensics may be done to better understand what caused the accident and how to prevent it in the future, uh, as well as potentially uh, legal implications. Uh, and, and just to add further to that, when I bought my BMW, basically the uh, lack of privacy statement, I like to call it, says uh, uh, we may use the data from your car for any purpose, including sharing it with our marketing partners and law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So I think many people have already actually surrendered their control of that data, but I'm not sure that there is a broad regulatory environment there in the event of an accident to extract all the data necessary for all uh, legal and liability purposes. Um, uh, is, there, is there a framework that I'm not aware of, or, or should there be, and what should that look like? Dave. Right. Um, if we take, for example, uh, sometimes airbags don't trigger. There are certain design parameters which the forces have to be at a certain level, the, uh, the speed of deceleration, the angle, all of that, and the airbag doesn't trigger. The customer thinks that the system is defective. We need the, the, the capability to monitor and measure and record what all the conditions were. 
So you can extract it. It's there in black and white. Uh, the, the issue of uh, unintended acceleration, obviously similar. So uh, manufacturers, I think, certainly uh, have the right to have systems on the vehicles that can monitor what the operating conditions were. I don't know that I have a particular opinion about uh, who owns it uh, and if law enforcement demands it, uh, perhaps if, if there's resistance, one can imagine soon the legislation will come to open it up. So it might be a moot point. I will tell you, if I, if I may just add one point, as far as the marketing aspect is concerned, you know that with the way the te technology and the connectivity is, is developing now, in theory, it is entirely plausible for big fleet operators to uh, create uh, systems whereby they monitor usage of their cars to, for normal considerations like speeding, yes, because you might want to know whether your people are driving safely, but fuel consumption, which is the most economic route, and you can create uh, a, 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 a safe, uh, you know, concealed access, uh, but data for the people who want to use it, all coming from the car. Now, uh, whether that's infringing someone's privacy or not, I don't know. Well, my, my son is, is one of a growing number of people now volunteering to have the black box in the car to reduce their insurance policies, which I think is a very growing thing in right. England. So even with your, would you like to see a black box in every car v for legislation purposes? Uh, not for legislation purposes, but I think it would help. I think it would be useful. And actually, um, this uh, uh, emotional attachment to the data is becoming less and less relevant. If you look at, for example, um, uh, commercial drivers, uh, their activities are monitored uh, through the digital tachograph already. We know exactly how many hours and minutes they were on rest, uh, they drove, um, and they had a day off. And if uh, they don't meet the social conditions that are for the regulator to consider what they are, then they will be fined and their company will be fined. So it is totally accepted already. I don't think we have such a big issue today as we had 10 years ago. Any more questions to the audience? Yeah, so I don't before you've got another question, let, let me, I'd like to really add from the communication get side in. Get in. on this. We just had in the US, um, big stories about a uh, General Motors recall of, of a problem with the um, ignition switch causing airbags not to go off. Um, that has gone on for a number of years. As you mentioned, we have black boxes. Almost every car in the U.S. has black box. Uh, most of Europe has as well. Um, we're building the communication systems into the cars. Um, I think there would be a tremendous advantage in finding these problems earlier by having that data transmitted so that it's available to the automotive manufacturers, engineers to look to see if they get a problem instead of, well, some accident happened, it got reported somewhere, it sort of floated around and a year later maybe we see four or five of these things. We, we have the communications capability. Again, it's the kind of thing where we need to look at, again, the regulatory environment, the issues of how can we get that data and make use of it to find the problems quickly, not five years later or things like that that have happened. Yes. Massively important point, because it allows predictability instead of waiting to see what happened. Mm -hmm. And it's good as a feedback for the driver as well. Because if you get regular feedback, okay, this week I drove like that, uh, here are the ways how you could improve, that would help uh, to refresh your own driving capacity. Because we discussed, but we didn't uh, uh, dig very much into the depths of it, that we need a different type of training for drivers. And it's not that you once uh, uh, trained, you get your driving license, and then for the next 40, 50 years you drive. Nowadays, with the technological changes, it would be needed to refresh your knowledge more often in different ways, without perhaps going to a course, but somehow through a feedback or, or in whatever way. It's my, my son gets a monthly report for his insurance company showing where he's been speeding, cornering, braking, accelerating. It's got four things. So he gets a monthly checkup, and if, if he does well, he's policy goes down for the next month and he's doing badly the money goes. It's a very good system just for, as you say, educating the driver and, and at the same time saving but, his money. I mean, this, you, you were mentioning <laughs> earlier about racing. I mean, in racing it's something which does exist. 
I mean, all the drivers are linked with the engineers, yeah. and they have in uh, real time all the information. And in the past, the driver could say, have had this problem which has caused the incident. Now, he cannot anymore, because there is a control about each single movement uh, he's doing. And it's something, I mean, which has started by racing, and then which is applied on the normal youth. I think the one thing we should say about motor racing, though, I mean, I think in, in crash survival, we talk about crash avoidance, but I think we've, we've moved on hugely in crash survival. When I'd raced a Formula One car, I was in an aluminium tin can with my feet in front of the front wheels, and now they're in these carbon fibre survival cells. I think we've learned an awful lot from that, and I think survivability now of, of accident is, is something we've improved massively. Anyway, any more from the audience? Do we have any more at the back, at the front? I know Malcolm at the front's got one question. Um. As uh, Hamadou mentioned, uh, our standardization work in ITU is one of our major activities. Uh, we have a very long history in developing international standards. Because originally they were telecommunication standards, and today they're more information and communication technology standards. And now that ICTs is in every walk of life, the challenge we're facing is to attract the vertical industries to come and work with us on developing these standards. So for, uh, for ITS, uh, I'd be very interested uh, in any suggestions that uh, Yonan or, or Jeff might have on how in ITU we can better attract uh, car manufacturers, the automotive industry, to, to work with us on these standards. Go ahead. Gosh, I wish I knew the answer. <laughs> uh, I, I think, you know, the, the, the irony is that everybody agrees that we should have standardization as long as it's their standard. Uh, and uh, I'm only going to be slightly mischievous when I say that sometimes um, there is a deliberate strategy to try to force one particular agenda that gets in the way of standardization uh, for competitive reasons. Uh, I'm not going to elaborate more other than to say that I have witnessed this personally, and uh, it's a shame. I, I think that uh, if... Uh, there is more willingness to cooperate uh, and uh, through, through just good common sense, work in the direction of standardization, setting aside pure self-interest and, and, and trying to get competitive advantage. In the long run, it will reduce costs for our industry in the billions. Yeah, and Johan, mm -hmm. one of the really important things with the ITU, and I've been involved in standards with SAE, ISO, everything. We moved the ITS communications to the ITU because as a UN agency, it does a good job of exactly preventing this effort by companies to go make their technology a standard and really provide the ability to pull it together. So it's not well understood by the car industry that ITU is a UN agency, but it does, by a UN agency, have the capabilities of really doing honest standards because it goes through a, a completely different process than some of the company-oriented standards efforts that I've been involved in. You know, I, I, I've been asked why car companies can't just agree on what seems like a relatively simple thing if we're moving to new uh, EV technology. Why can't we agree on a common charging system? Just the socket, for heaven's sake. Why can't we standardize that? Well, uh, walk around the world. I mean, how much money could we all have saved if we just had our consumer electronics with a standardized socket? It so, was, uh, it took ITU many years before we came with uh, a standardized uh, uh, charger for mobile phones, which is uh, uh, a global standard now, which uh, really helps uh, save so many uh, tons of, uh, of uh, carbon dioxide a year. Uh, it's, uh, it seems like a revolution, uh, but it was a very simple thing to do, and uh, I fully agree with you. We need to come to those kind of uh, standards that will actually give opportunity for more innovation, because standardization can be seen. If you all go on one standard, some people may think that uh, competition will then stop, uh, innovation will stop. No, on the contrary. Because the moment you go on one common standard, there will be massive uh, uh, mass production and costs will, costs will go down. But also, the manufacturers will continue to do some more research and development on the next. That's why we are now uh, talking about 4, 4G, 
for for generation, but 5G is a key that will be uh, helping our next uh, 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 fully networked cars. And this is well underway in terms of research and development in ITU. Well, in our experience, standard setting must be technology neutral. It shouldn't favor one company or the other. In the World Forum for Harmonization of Vehicle Regulations, we don't set standards, but regulations. They are quasi-standards. And uh, actually, in our meetings, the private sector is represented through OICA, through CLEPA, through the different organizations themselves. Uh, they have a voice. Of course, governments decide. And it's never one solution that is facilitated, but uh, the framework for for the solution. Uh, okay, there are regulations, but recently we have had this experience that sometimes you cannot agree on a very strict regulation or standard for the packing of containers, which is a totally different topic, but there um, the common understanding was that we cannot have standards today, but we can have something else. So we agreed on code of conduct. It was a joint work with ILO, IMO, and UNECE. So now this co joint code of conduct is the sort of obligatory because the business uh, representatives themselves accept it as their mandatory code of ethical code of conduct. So sometimes you don't have to go for standards. There are other solutions as well. But if we could just leave standards and legislation for a moment then, Jeff, where could we actually be in the dream world if we didn't have any regulation? I mean, I've read about sort of, you know, you could have delivery vans now going out to Los Angeles and delivering to addresses. Is that really possible now with the technology we have? Yeah, it's, it's possible. The technology is doable. It, um, affordability is an issue. The legal framework, the regulatory environment, those are all big issues, right? The privacy data, but uh, uh, it's possible to do that? Is it uh, affordable to do that? Is there a business case to do that? It's like many of the uh, electric vehicle platforms. Solves some problems, creates a few others. At the end of the day, the consumer votes, right, on what they'll pay for and what they won't pay for. They'll vote on what they save versus what they fill up at the pump, do the math, and they'll make the choice. So at the end of the day, they can't put anything on a car that the consumer won't buy, right? It has to help them sell more vehicles. It has to help them um, differentiate uh, their brand, perhaps. So possible, yes. But I mean, Russ, you, you pretty much could go on the freeway of this Q50 now and have the lane on, the speed control on, and collision would, would warn you. You could almost now, with that very car, switch off on, on the motorway. It's more than 80% there. And the last 20%, I think, will be done. But the reality is now, I can't e safely do my email while I'm driving. But There's a moral obligation, a tang in a way. No, <laughs> Self-preservation. <laughs> uh, but I can have somebody else drive and sit in the back seat and do it. And I really would like to get back in the front seat. And I do think in this time frame, it will happen. And, and the what Jeff said in answer to your basic original question, the real thing is when. The technology will make many of these things happen. And we can argue a year here, a year there. But uh, I, say I started mobile phones in 1979. When we finally put out the, the first mobile phones that were portable, you had a big bag to carry, and then it became a brick from Motorola. But Inevitably, the technology made these things better. And the, the nature of the ICT technology, um, communications will go to 5G, it will be another step over LTE. These costs are going to continue to come down. We have not, we have not reached that plateau yet. And we have more processors. The processors are getting faster and faster. Um, that car... Um, count I saw had close to 100 processors in it, um, some of which are much faster than what your PC is and what have you. That's, that's already there. And a generation, two generations, will be able to do much more. And it becomes um, the ability for us to do our yeah. software reliably. Um, and there's a whole big issue about how do we actually make sure that the software there always does what it does, and that's why I think for, for 
um, Johan's company and others, the ability to get that information back. If something happened, I had a close miss on my automated car, much less I hit something. If the engineers can immediately get that and they can look at it and they can figure out, oh, I need to tweak my algorithm a little and I send it back to the car, that, that takes us out of these kind of things where we have um, the worst case in the US on the Ford Explorer and the tires yeah. where um, almost 100 people were killed for a problem that could have been identified um, with the first one or two. And that's, that's all part of this step-by-step -step inevitable parts of the technology that we have to work together. To well, make we're, we're about running out. I think we're running out of time now. Yeah, right. I know. Well, I think what we've learned really is now that, that there is an amazing future for the network car. And I think you know that we've opened up so many areas to look at legislation standardisation. And I think really, it's just one quick answer. I think I want from all of you now, and that is: Are you looking forward to the time when the fully automated car is there? Dr. Turek. We are at the dawn of the new revolution, and really looking forward to You're it. You're looking forward. To Absolutely, it. Jean. I mean, not really. You know, I mean, for me, uh, we have to remain uh, sensible. And uh, I do look very much for driver ed, but uh, I think we still need a driver. Go ahead. As long as I can continue to enjoy driving the car when I want to, then it, let the technology help me when it's a chore. When it's a chore. Mm -hmm. Ross, we already know you, you want know. I, I want my time back. You already got the hairpin <laughs> bends as well, over in Santa Monica, every, all the corners. You want it all done automatically one yes. day. Jeff. I like to drive as well, but uh, 1.2 million fatalities every year. You could cut that in half with this technology. I like that. I like that future. Eva. Well, I'm looking forward to the results that are being promised. Looking forward. I think we're all, well, we're all looking forward to the amazing technology that come our way. Thank you very much for your time, and thank you all for being here. Thank you to the panel. Thank you.